is I want to cast vision for you. I want you to get a vision of what God wants to do in the big picture. But what I really hope happens is that you'll get a vision for what God wants to do through you. As a church, a plural you, and then also you individually as followers of Jesus Christ. What does God want to do in you and through you? So let me pray. Father, we thank you so much that we can gather together in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you would cast vision, that you yourself would come in power and open our eyes to what's in your word, that we would be encouraged, that we would believe that this vision is attainable because you're the one who's going to accomplish it. And I pray, God, would you speak to everyone here about their role in your grand rescue plan. Each person, Lord, you want to use for the glory of your name. And I pray that there would not be a person who would walk out of this room thinking that he isn't gifted enough or that she can't do it or that they're unable. But I pray instead that every single person would receive your grace, your forgiveness in Christ, your removal of shame, and would be empowered and filled by your spirit to go out and be testifiers of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Now, I really wish that we could just take the whole time and lay out God's plan from creation to Christ in order to see God's big vision for the world. I'm going to say it all in about four four or five sentences. God created us for his glory. He made man and woman in his image. And then he told them to be fruitful and to multiply. And why did he want us to multiply? So that the world would be increasingly covered with image bearers. So there would be more and more people throughout the world bearing the image of God so that God's glory would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's God's vision, and that's what God is at work doing, even today. And it's going to happen. And this morning, I'm going to share with you two simple and yet very profound truths that I hope will stir up a vision in you. If we can really feel the weight of these two truths, I think that we would be different people, changed. And so I want you to see what God can accomplish, what God will accomplish, and what God wants to use you to accomplish. So these are the two visions. These are the two simple truths. One, Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And two, in his rescue plan to save sinners, God wants to use you. That's a plural you, City on a Hill Church in Rosemount, Minnesota. And that's an individual you, every one of you. So, number one, Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is straight from Paul's first letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1.15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. So there it is. Jesus came to save sinners. This is important for a number of reasons. First of all, it reminds us who we are, or perhaps I should say who we were if we're in Christ Jesus. Because those who are in Christ are defined not primarily by the fact that they're sinners, though sin remains. We're primarily defined by the fact that we are sons and daughters of the living God. That's who we are. But we were sinners. And Ephesians 2 even says that we were dead in our sins and that we were by nature children of wrath. And therefore, we understand from this that we are not better than any person around us. We are not better than the sinners who are around us. We can't begin to think that somehow, by nature of our birth, by nature of our actions, our family, our job, our position in society, our wealth, our good works, or any other thing, somehow we're more worthy of God's grace, more deserving. No one's born a Christian. Every single person is born a sinner. Paul even says that he's the worst sinner he knows. 
of whom I am the foremost. Now, Paul lived in the days of some pretty spectacular sinners. Think about the Emperor Nero. He killed people on a whim, burning them alive if he wanted to. There were some pretty wicked sinners. And yet Paul says that he is the worst of sinners. Now, what is that? What's he doing there? Is, that, is he just being foolish? I don't think he's being foolish. Now, if we look back and compare Paul to Nero, for example, objectively, we would say, well, of course he's not as bad as him. These things are much worse. But Paul's not looking at the outward. He's looking at the inward. He's looking inside his own heart, and he's seeing the depths of his sin, the sin that still remains, his thoughts, his intentions, his actions, the things he's living. He's seeing it more deeply and more deeply and more deeply. And therefore, the, the sin that he sees inside of him, the, re, the selfish rebellion, the desire to place himself in the position of God so that he gets the glory rather than God, as he sees how deep that goes, he comes to realize the depths of sin I see in my heart are deeper than any of the outward things I'm seeing in these people because he can't see in their hearts. And so Paul is, in fact, the worst sinner he knows. And if we're honest with ourselves and really examine our own hearts, we'll see it's true for us. I am the worst sinner I know. And you are the worst sinner you know, unless you're deceiving yourself, which we do like to do. We are the worst sinners we know. But that's exactly what makes this text so encouraging. Even though I'm the worst sinner I know, I'm exactly the kind of person Jesus came to save. Because he came to save who? Sinners. So even, I don't have to be afraid of self-evaluation. I don't have to be afraid that I'm going to dive into the depths of my heart and find out that, oh, I'm such a bad sinner. God will never forgive me. No, because that's exactly who God came to save. So we don't have to fear that. Jesus came to save sinners. And therefore, no sin I do, I think, or I desire could possibly put me outside of Jesus' plan to save sinners. That's exactly who he came to save. And so the really good news is that I am the kind of person Jesus came to save. And I don't have to stop being a sinner first. He didn't come to save the righteous. He came to save sinners. He doesn't wait for me to change myself. He comes and saves me as I am. He saves sinners. He gives grace to sinners. He has mercy on sinners. Sinners who simply come to be saved. Sinners who believe in him. Sinners who are tired of trying to be better on their own, tired of their guilt and shame, tired of living for the approval of others, tired of the endless cycle of slavery to sin. Sinners who recognize they'll never be good enough, and so they stop trying and simply come. Sinners who confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in their hearts that God raised him from the dead. Those are the people Jesus came to save. Furthermore, this truth transforms not only the way we think about ourselves in relation to God, but it also transforms the way we think about others. Now, I live in Jordan. So we've got Israel-Palestine on our west, Syria to the north, Iraq to the east, and Saudi Arabia to the south. So you could say we are surrounded in many ways by bloodshed and violence, right? We've been taught that Arab Muslims are terrorists. Bloodthirsty terrorists. Now, that's not actually true. Most are just like us, just like you and me, wanting to live their lives, give a good education to their kids, have a future, going to work, trying to establish their families and homes. That's what most people are. But even if it was true, what would they be? They'd still be sinners, right? They wouldn't suddenly go from sinners to something else. They'd still be sinners. 
Well, those are exactly the people Jesus came to save. So I'm surrounded by the people Jesus is coming to rescue. Now, here we are in America. And honestly, divisions are deep here. We no longer simply disagree with one another. We actually now believe that the person who has a different idea is not just wrong. He or she is wicked and evil. That's how divided we've become. For example, many don't simply disagree with President Biden. They believe he's ushering in a wave of liberalism and leftism with communists who will destroy the nation. They are set, they believe, on taking away our rights and removing God from society. Well, that sounds pretty bad. Sounds like they're sinners. Those are just the people Jesus came to save. Now, on the other hand, others believe that President Trump and Christian nationalists left a stain on America because they sought to destroy democracy. They are set on throwing, overthrowing elections and promoting white supremacy. Well, that sounds pretty bad. Sounds like they're sinners. Ha! Huh. They're just the people Jesus came to save. So you see, of course, my point is that even the worst person you can think of, he's not worse than a sinner. And therefore, he or she is exactly the person Jesus came to save. So we're surrounded by people Jesus came to give his life for. To die for. That's who we're surrounded by. There, we may want to think that there are particular kinds of sinners that are further outside God's grace or that are less deserving, but that's not what Jesus thinks. That's not his position. When he came and took on flesh and died on the cross, bearing the wrath of God, he said it about the people killing him. I mean, that's pretty bad, killing him. He said, Father, forgive them. That's his heart for sinners, every single one of them. And so, as Paul says in Romans, whoops, this is Romans 5, 6 to 8, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for whom? The ungodly. Sinners, bad people, wicked people, evil people, the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God, he shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the first thing I want us to see with, with greater clarity is Jesus came to save sinners. Of whom I am the foremost. Number two. In this rescue plan to save sinners, God wants to use you. You. Jesus came to save sinners, but he didn't come to do it by himself. He could have. He could have come lived his righteous life and died on the cross and rose from the dead and then wrote the gospel in the stars for the whole world to see. He could have done that. He could have come and died and rose again and then appeared to everyone just like he did to Paul on the Damascus road. He could do that. He could come to every person in his or her dream at night and speak the gospel to them. He could do that. There are a million ways that Jesus could Proclaim the gospel all by himself. But that's not what he chose to do. He chose the one way that requires his people. And so he wants to use us in his rescue plan to save sinners. Not because he had to, but because he wanted to. He wanted to. He wants to use you. So Paul wrote in 2 Timothy... Chapter 2, 
Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe that you can be useful to God? Do you believe that you can be made ready for every good work? You don't have to sit on the sidelines thinking that pastors and missionaries are the ones that God wants to use. He's made each one of us, and he wants to use each one of us. He wants to use every single person in this room. There are things that God wants to accomplish in you and through you. In fact, there are people who may never hear the gospel if you don't speak it. There are people who will never experience gracious Christian hospitality if you don't invite them to your homes. We have a place. We have a role. God wants to use us. In fact, God has given each one of us a, a gift, a spiritual gift. If you are in Christ and he has given you his spirit and the spirit of God in you is giving you a gift for the good of others. Now, it might be teaching. It might be administration. It might be giving. It could be acts of mercy. It could be worship leading. It could be praying. It could be friendliness. It can be an ability to go deep with people. There are thousands of gifts that the Spirit of God gives His people, all for the same purpose, that we would, by His power, be witnesses to Jesus. Now, I don't know what your gift is, but I know you have one if you're in Christ. I know you have one if you're in Christ. You may not know what your gift is. And so ask the people around you, what are the things I do that you really feel encouraged by? That's how we typically know what our gifts are. We do something we enjoy doing, and others say, wow, that really blessed me. Thank you. If you don't know what your gift is, that's okay, because this church is here. The elders are here. Pastor Bruce is here, and they'd love to help you discover this and find out how to grow in using it. The Spirit of God, if you're in Christ, He lives in you, and He wants to use you. He gives you power to be a witness for Jesus. Now imagine the good that God can do through you if you will submit to Him and then act in faith. I mean, you think about famous preachers like Billy Graham and we tend to think it's because Billy Graham is, was such a great preacher, that's why thousands came and heard him and gave their lives to Jesus. That's not true. It's because the Spirit of God gave him a gift, and then through that gift, worked in the hearts of others. Well, that same Spirit lives in you. And do you think he's really dependent on the natural abilities of any man or woman in order to act? He's not. In no way do you constrain or restrain the Spirit of God by your natural abilities or lack thereof. He wants to use you. And so, as our text says, be cleansed. You might think that you have nothing to offer, but, but be cleansed. Flee from the sin that so easily entangles, the passions of your heart that are impure, Wash yourself with the word of God and prayer. And then go and act. Put down your phone. Call up your neighbor. Invite them over. Or go come and, and, and gather with some others and go prayer walking in Rosemount. There's a thousand things you can do. And God wants to use you. 
He wants to use you. Speak kind words. Speak bold words. Speak true words. Speak gracious words. And through those words, God can act. And then serve, even without words. And through that service, God can act. But you need to believe this. You need to believe that God wants to use you. Because that's what will enable you to get up and move. Now, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, if it'll come. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Uh, This is important for us to see that, that grace was given to whom? Each one of us. Every one of us has been given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Not according to the measure of our abilities, according to the measure of Christ's gift. So there are no exceptions. And then Paul says right after this, in the same chapter, that the the apostles, God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, all who call on Christ are saints. When when you read the word saint in the Bible, that just means someone who believes in Jesus. It doesn't mean Mother Teresa or someone who lived this great, amazing life and did miracles. It simply means someone who's calling on Jesus, trusting in him, resting in him, believing in him. That's what a saint is. And here it says that that God gave apostles, he gave prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why? To equip the saints, you, for the work of the ministry. So who is it that does the work of ministry? It's not the prophets and apostles and pastors and teachers. It's the saints. It's you. You are the ones who need to be visiting the sick in the hospital. You're the ones who need to be giving food to the hungry and meeting the needs of neighbors, sharing the good news with those who do not know Jesus, reading the Bible with others. Earlier, I showed you the video of some of us prayer walking. The Arab man who goes with us each week became a believer some time ago, uh, but he began to feel burdened for his nation, and especially those areas where there are no churches, and there's less than 2% Christian. And he was really burdened for those places where there's no visible witness to Jesus. And so he did something about it. He decided that on his one day off a week, he would get on a bus and each week go to a different area in the country to prayer walk. Simply walking around, praying for God's blessings on the people he saw, the businesses he saw, the places he saw, asking God to bless. And that's what he started doing. So one Friday, he and some others that went with him, they were in one of these areas, and he stopped at a restaurant to eat. And before they ate, they bowed their heads and they prayed. Now, the restaurant owner thought that was strange. He came over, he asked him, what were you doing? And he said, well, we were thanking God for blessing us with this food. And asking him to give food to those around in this area that don't have it. So this really intrigued the restaurant owner, and he started asking more questions. My friend saw this as an opportunity to share about Jesus, just simply sharing who Jesus is and what the difference he's made in his own life. And after that, the the restaurant owner said, okay, next week you need to come back. But you're not eating at this restaurant. You're coming to my house, and you're going to eat there. And so he did. The next week he came back. They shared more about Jesus. And over some weeks, this man and his family became followers of Jesus and believed. And now there's actually a a church, a, a small church of a number of families who gather together in this guy's home to worship God in Christ. In this place where there are no physical church buildings. Now, my friend is not a trained pastor. He works in a home repair, like a small building about the size of two of those round tables, small room, and sells home repair supplies, like plumbing pipes and paintbrushes and nuts and bolts. 
The difference, though, is he didn't believe the lie that only pastors and missionaries and those who've been trained can do ministry. Instead, he believed the truth that God wanted to use him. And what did he do? He just went out and prayed. And then God brought this opportunity to share. And he didn't remain quiet. He could have. But he spoke boldly. He believed that God could use him. And God did. And God still is. So now I ask you, do you believe that God can use you? If you don't, let's just be honest. What are you saying about God? If God can't use you, he must not be very powerful. If somehow you're a unique individual, God can use all the other people, but he can't use me. Well, you're saying God does not have all power, and wow, that's a lot of pride, isn't it? That somehow I am uniquely ill-suited for God. Of course, that's just not true. And so I want to encourage you, last verse, to go. So go. What do we do? We go. Of course, this is a great commission. Jesus' last words to his disciples in the book of Matthew. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, I think that sometimes people can read this verse and get really intimidated. Oh, making disciples? That sounds hard. That's what, that's what Emma does. That's hard work. She's trained for that, and that's what she does all the time. I can't do that. Baptizing? Oh, that's what Pastor Bruce does. I can't do that. That's hard. Let's not complicate things more than they are. When, when Jesus basically summarizes what it means to make disciples, he says, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Well, are you walking in obedience to the Lord, trying to obey him and how you raise your children? You can teach others to do that. You can get together with a, a young mom if you've raised kids and, and just encourage her about how she can help raise her kids. You can do that. Can you make a meal for your neighbor when he's been in the hospital and show mercy and love your neighbor as yourself? You can do that. Absolutely, you can do that. Can you, when someone says a harsh word to you, can you give a gentle answer? You can do that, right? You can do that. So let's not make this so complicated as if making disciples, you've got to have this whole big training program and be trained and go to years of seminary and then learn how to do it and have this real formal, you come and meet me and read this book. We can just live our lives and invite others to come with us and walk with us as we live that life, encouraging them. But of course, the key is we've got to be intentional. We have to actually believe. God wants to use me to disciple this person, to help this person learn to obey him. God wants to do that in me, and God can use me to do that. So Jesus came to save sinners. And in that rescue plan to save sinners, he wants to use you. He wants to use you. So go. Do it. Pray. Father, we're so thankful that you sent your son Jesus to save sinners. We recognize that there is no hope apart from him. There's nothing I could do to make myself worthy of your grace. There's nothing I could do to earn or merit your mercy. I'm a sinner. And that's exactly who you came to save. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. And Father, would you transform our own minds to see that the people around us, even the people we don't like, the people we think are just so wrong, the people we believe have evil motives and want to do bad things, they are not worse than sinners, and you came to save them, Lord Jesus. Would you help us to see that, to recognize that all are born in sin, and all are sinners for whom you came to die. And then, Father, would you send your Spirit and fill us now with your Spirit, each one of us, and help us believe that you want to use us. 
give us courage. We're maybe fearful. Maybe we still doubt that we can be useful. Help us to cleanse out, to flee sin, to be cleansed so that we can, by your grace, be useful to you, our master, ready for every good work. Thank you for your kindness to us to save us. Thank you for the great privilege of walking with us and using us for your glory's sake. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.